So we have uh, Professor Andrew Field here today, and uh, he is the world's expert on uh, old nightclubs and dance halls in Shanghai. And uh, without any further ado, take it away. Thank you, Patrick. Um, the Paramount really was the iconic ballroom of, it, of the Deco era. Uh, no other ballroom came close. So I'm borrowing from one of our most renowned experts, Tess Johnston and Deepar, wrote this book, Shanghai Art Deco. And uh, this is the definition that they came up with. It's a modern spirited school of design noted for its simplicity and with particular stress, that should be stress, not streets, on geometric lines and colors, dynamic and imbued with a fervor for progress. I don't think there's a better definition in any book. And I'm sure it was not mine book. or ours. <laughs> <laughs> it from somewhere. Now I want to talk about the Paramount Ballroom. This, this ballroom started up in 1931 when, um, when the builders started it. I think, uh, how many of you are familiar with this ballroom? How many of you have, in fact, been to the ballroom? Has anybody been inside the ballroom? <coughs> Has anybody danced in the ballroom? <laughs> Just me, one or two, okay. Uh, fascinating place, many decades of existence. It's one of the only remaining, it's really the only remaining standalone dance palace from that age and uh, still being used as a dance hall today. Um, I, although I think it's undergoing another round of renovations, who knows what it's gonna look like at the end of that. But um, as of you know, a couple of years ago, when I was last there, they were having uh, dance parties on the fourth floor and uh, they did old traditional ballroom style dancing there. So they're preserving a legacy that goes back to the 1930s. And whenever um, you know, tourists come to town, especially from places like Taiwan, they want to go visit the Paramount Ballroom because it's such a legendary space. So the ballroom was opened in 1933. And I should, I should mention that the, the people who um, constructed this ballroom were Chinese. This was... Uh, in, in my book, I claim that uh, this was really a statement of kind of nationalism on the Chinese side. Obviously, it was a commercial venture uh, to begin with, but it was also a powerful statement of Chinese nationalism to say, hey, you know, we're just as modern as you folks in New York or Paris or London, and we can, we can build a ballroom that's even better than anything you have in the West. And you can see that nationalism still going on today with all these buildings on the Pudong side. This, you know, let's beat the West kind of mentality. And I think they succeeded in, in building a ballroom that was definitely as, as good, uh, as luxurious, and as modern as anything that you would have seen in New York or Paris at that time. Now, the high, the, uh, the high life of this ballroom didn't, didn't last very long. The ballroom existed as an elite you know, luxury dance palace for, for the rich, for the, for the wealthy, for the, the famous, only for a small space of time. So it was, it was really from its opening in December 1933. By 1936, you are, it's already in trouble um, financially. And uh, the owners um, declared bankruptcy. And then you see in the newspapers that a group of employees, um, many of whom were the Russian performers, band leaders and so on, and, and dancers in the club, they're suing the owners for back pay. It's, a, again, a very familiar story. If you, uh, if you know anything about the world of Shanghai nightlife today, you'll hear similar stories going on all the time. And then in 1937, the owners of the ballroom sold it to another set of owners who turned it into the more profitable model of a taxi dance hall. How many of you here know what a taxi dance hall is? Uh, okay, for the Chinese people out there, how many of you know what a wu nu is? 
I'm, okay, interesting. Not seeing a lot of hands. That means that a lot of you haven't read my book yet. <laughs> you, need, you need to get it. You go to the bookstore. Okay. So, yeah, the highlight, uh, you know, the high life of the Bog, the Golden Age, was really only from 1934 to 1937, and it, it still functioned as a luxury dance house, but it was it was never quite the same as it was in in that short period. This uh, these photos that I'm going to show you are all from a uh, an architectural magazine called Zhongguo Tianzhu, which. Uh, was being published in the 1930s. Wonderful repository of, uh, for all sorts of uh, buildings, both exterior and interior, from that period. And you can find the originals in the Shanghai Municipal Library. So this is what it looked like in the exterior. And if you go there today to the corner of Yu Yuan Lu, and just right across from the Jing'an Temple, you'll still see it there. And and in fact, it doesn't look too different now than what it looked like in the 1930s. They've even restored the, uh, the original iconic, you know, deco style marquee. I think one thing that really stands out in the building that, that makes it kind of quintessential deco style is you have these vertical lines going up that are reinforced at night with the lights. So they're just shooting up into the sky, and you have this vertical tower of concentric uh, cylinders that is shooting up into the sky and projecting its light. And, and it was said that you could see this from, for, for miles. Um, because that, back in those days, this was definitely the tallest building in that neighborhood, and uh, one of the tallest buildings in the area. So it would have competed with the beacon towers of the major department stores at that time. <clears throat> so you can see how this cylinder is totally lit up at night. And this, this then would have been a welcoming beacon at night, just attracting people kind of like, like moths to a flame, right? Uh, bringing the elite, elite Shanghai society. And like I said, this was a, a ballroom that was built by... Um, Chinese uh, financiers, bankers, and it was making a powerful statement about Chinese modernity. The architect, who I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, was also Chinese, so that's another important thing to remember. <clears throat> so once you get close enough, uh, you will like... Now, what I want you to do, just because I, I, I think we're all fascinated by the 1930s. Who, who here is fascinated by the 1930s? Okay. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. And I think we all have this, we all want to go back in time. We, we would, any one of us would pay amazing amounts of money if we, if we could to go back in a time machine just to see what it was actually like. So I don't, I don't even want to say that some of us might have even lived in the 1930s. <laughs> But uh, we all want to, we, we, we would all love to just go back even momentarily to see what it was like. And uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's a nostalgia. I give tours of the city to some of these spaces, and I always try to remind my, the people on the tour that, um, you know, these were terrible times. I mean, if you were, uh, if you were walking down the streets of Shanghai, you might, you might actually pass over a dozen dead bodies on your way to the gym. I, because it, this was a terrible age. There, was, there were epidemic diseases. China was racked with warlords. There were, you know, this was an era sandwiched between the two great wars of the century. Terrible famine, disease, uh, epic poverty. It's no wonder there was a communist revolution in China. This, the, <clears throat> this was a tough period. Um, so just... You know, we have to kind of temper our nostalgia by remembering the dark side of this period. But I think it also explains why people went to such great lengths to build these luxury palaces because they wanted to escape the depressing realities of, of life during that time period. So um, I think this resonates with your talk just now that, you know, they were really constructing a fantasy world. And you can see that 
here in the, it's the design of the entrance, it, it really looks cinematic. It looks like you're entering into a cinema of the same time period. It's, you're, you're, you go through the doors and you're, you're buying into a fantasy world. You're leaving the world of reality behind. But unlike the cinema where you experienced it all vicariously <coughs> on a silver screen, in this world you actually you live the drama. As soon as you step inside, you buy into this notion that you are an actor in your own dramatic story. So when you think about it, this is one of the, one of the things that, that you do <clears throat> when you go out of the town, you go to a nightclub. It's an action environment where you can script your own story. You want to meet a beautiful person and fall in love? You know, rather than seeing that happen on, on film, you actually experience that by going into a ballroom and dancing with somebody, falling in love, etc., etc. Um, you want to hang out with movie stars or famous gangsters, you can do that too. So you're kind of subscribing to, you know, being part of a story. I want to pull back and show you the blueprints to show you what a wonderfully complex space this was. This is just the ground floor. So the main thing to focus on is you have a lobby here with uh, a uh, semi-circular staircase leading up. So just um, take a pause and just imagine for a moment that you're, and some of you might have actually seen this uh, going into the ballroom today. It's still there. The structure is still there. But just imagine for a moment that it is in the 1930s, mid-1930s, and you're about to step into the ballroom. How would you feel? How do you feel looking up those stairs? What kind of an effect does that give you? Excited, anticipatory. Waiting for the, the drama, the glamour. Yeah. And entering into the space, right? Like the world. Why is it so exciting? Why why did they design it this particular way, you think? Because you don't see what is at the end. You don't see what's at the end. So there's this mystery, right? There's something waiting for you up there, you don't quite know what it is. So obviously that was all very intentional on the part of the architect. And then uh, here here you see a view of the first floor. So going up the stairs, you will arrive in a circular lobby, and that will lead you through other doors to the main ballroom, and then there are other spaces as well. So you have the main dance floor here, and then next to it you had a bar, which was actually very, um, very novel at that time to integrate the space of a bar into a ballroom. So that was another innovation of the Paramount. We don't think of it as being very novel today. The idea of a bar lounge, dance club, it's all mixed up. But actually, this club really anticipated the, the, the design principles of clubs in, in recent times. I mean, this was so ahead of its time in terms of the way that the designer, the architect, thought about the space. So I'm, I'm giving you a, an excerpt from the article that accompanied this, uh, uh, the, the text that accompanied these photos in the architectural magazine. So I'll just read it to you. This is from the, uh, written by Yang Xilio, who was the, the architect of this ballroom. And he had studied at uh, Nanyang College, which was the precursor to Jiao Tong Dashia, Jiao Tong University. Um, he writes that the Paramount Ballroom is the largest dance hall in Shanghai. It therefore must hold around a thousand people and can meet the needs of any large party or event. So the scope and size of the establishment must be quite large, which makes the interior design much more difficult. According to crowd psychology, groups of people enjoy a ruckus. I think he used the word renal and they detest loneliness. So this is a translation from Chinese. Um, so if the dance hall is too spacious, only during a special holiday or special event will the guests feel enjoyment. But on normal days when there are far fewer guests, such a spacious environment contributes to feelings of loneliness and isolation. 
The Majestic Hotel was just such a case. On normal days when there were few guests, there was a feeling of loneliness like stepping into an ancient disused palace, which lessened the enjoyment of the place. This is one element of design that any dance hall cannot afford to overlook. And this is uh, referring to the Majestic Hotel, which had operated in Shanghai in the 1920s. It was built in around 1925. And uh, its centerpiece was a ballroom with a marble dance uh, floor and fountain in the center and so on and so forth. Um, very, uh, you know, classical, neoclassical design, but it was not very comfortable and it was a very cavernous and spacious place. And uh, the, the architect seems to be arguing that that's why it shut down eventually. Actually, the, the hotel um, didn't survive the depression and the place was shut down and destroyed. And it's now on the grounds of uh, the Meilongzhen Guangchang or the Westgate Mall. Um, so they, he was kind of referring to the demise of this of this dancing space and saying the Paramount is, is built under different design principles that will sustain a business long term. And he was absolutely right. It's still functioning today as a dance club. So this is what the lobby looked like when you um, when you went upstairs. Um, you would see this. Uh, Wonderful, you know, I suppose we, we could call this deco, deco style furniture. The circular couch in the center with the statuettes, the lights, <clears throat> and then these chairs. And, and these chairs were so, they, they thought that they were so emblematic of the, the modern design work that they um, have a whole photograph just devoted to the chairs. Just to show that every element that went into this club was part of an overall design. So they really, they spared no detail. And so again, we're still in the lobby and you can imagine uh, this was a space used for you know, people to wait for um, other guests to arrive or just to escape the noise of the main ballroom and come out and have a breather, maybe smoke a cigarette. And again, um, no detail was spared. So they went to great lengths to design not only the marquee, but also even the the uh, you know above the different uh, services. They they designed special lettering. And now you walk into the main ballroom, and this is what you see. It was a, quite a magnificent sight. Again, it's kind of hard to imagine from our perspective in the 21st century, but this was quite something back in the 1930s to walk into a ballroom like this. The wooden dance floor had been built by an American company and it was built on cantilever springs so that um, it was a, what we call a sprung dance floor so that you could dance for hours theoretically and not feel tired. Totally different to the design of the majestic hotel ballroom that I just mentioned which was, you know, marble polished floor, very hard floor. Um, you get very tired dancing on a hard floor. So the oval design of the dance floors at this time was reflective of the style of dancing where people would, would dance around, either, I suppose, clockwise or counterclockwise, but they would dance around in, in it was a collective decision that they would dance in, in one direction and it was almost like a race course, right? It was built kind of along the same principles. Um, and all the dancing, of course, at that time was standardized. So you would have a foxtrot followed by perhaps a waltz, followed by a rumba or a tango and so on. And back then everybody knew the dances and they were all dressed, you can imagine, if, if they had taken a photograph of this space while it was filled with people, the ladies would be in ball gowns imported from Paris or Milan, and the gentlemen would be in tuxedos or evening, evening dress. So then they had um, all of the tables on the side of the dance floor. Notice there's a slight elevation here for the tables, and then the stage in the back where the, uh, the band played or where they had special performances. And then you notice that there are balconies on either side where people can also sit and they can look down on the dancers. So 
a big part of the fun was watching the spectacle of the dancing, and there's no better place to do that than from above. And this is what it looked like if you if you looked up, you could see the uh, the lights uh, running down the, the uh, ceiling over the main ballroom, and there are all sorts of stylized features that are. Um, highlighted in this architectural magazine showing, again, the deco elements, these abstract design elements that went into the making of this ballroom. And here again is a view looking up from the vantage point of the, uh, the tables and uh, looking up at the lights, the fixtures, and so on. And also these, uh, again, very stylized, I, I don't even know what these any architectural person here know what this is called? This this particular feature, a scroll or a cobble. I think it's a cobble. But the cobble, the motif. Scroll yeah. Scroll motif. Corbel yeah, the scroll motif, 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 right? Corbel. Is that what it's called? B E W L. Corbel. Okay. Good. Um, so uh, again. No detail to spare. There's so much thought that goes into the design elements and integrating them together into a whole. Trust me when I say that uh, all of this is gone in the uh, in the Paramount today, and unless they take great pains to restore it to its original, well, they always say that they're going to do that, and then we're always disappointed when we go and see the results. Um, but I, I don't think that you'll you'll find anything nearly as elegant as what existed back then. And so here is the stage, and you can see that they, they had the band that was playing at that particular time posing at the stage. Here's another vantage point looking out towards where the bar lounge area is. And again, you see these uh, all of these stylized deco elements, just giving the club a very uh, luxurious and an ultra modern feel. One of the American visitors, in fact, in our uh, our new book, which is coming out early next year, called Shanghai Nightscapes. Um, I've published, uh, I've written a book with a sociologist named James Ferrer, where we go through a century of nightlife in Shanghai, all the way up to the present day, and it's called Shanghai Nightscapes. It's coming out of U Chicago Press early next year. And we start with, the, with uh, a vignette written by an American tourist named Ruth Day, who came here in 1935, and she wrote a memoir about it, about her trip. And she made these wonderful observations of, of the social life and of the spaces that she visited, including the Paramount Ballroom. She spent an evening here, and uh, she said that it was this ultra-modern space done in nickel, and, and it... And, uh, it it was as up to date as any ballroom she was familiar with from New York and so forth. And uh, she talked about the Russian women who, who served as dancers there, who did the, the floor show and so on and so forth. I'll tell you a little bit more about her observations when we go upstairs. But here's the bar. And again, um, very modern. You know, these... Uh, Circular bar stools here that are uh, you know, uh, fixed to the floor, and all of the see all the bottles arrayed behind the bar. The bartender standing there. So again, this would have been a very special and unique space within the ballroom because no other uh, ballroom of that time period boasted a bar inside of the ballroom. So the idea is to uh, create a multiplicity of spaces that people could inhabit as they spent a night in the ballroom so that it didn't feel just like one space. It, it felt like it was many different clubs wrapped up into one. And if you look at the way clubs are designed today, the best ones also use that same design principle. And then looking upstairs, you can see um, this space that juts out in a semicircle here. So you're wondering what's there. And then you have these colored light wheels that are shining different colored spotlights down on the dancers, contributing to the spectacle. 
of the dancing. So moving upstairs, and it, notice even features like a lantern are highlighted in the architectural magazine just to show every distinct design element, especially when it, when it referenced light, anything having to do with light. And here you get up, up to the upper floor, and again you have a multiplicity of spaces. You have an upper dance floor looking down upon the main hall. Behind that is a banquet room. It's a, what we call a baofang in China today, where you can rent you can rent the room for a night with a for a private party with your friends. So again, you know. That is so ahead of its time, just anticipating the culture of the Baofang that's so popular in clubs and so so important in the club scene in Shanghai today. And you have another private dining room back here. So the idea is that you have this hierarchy of VIP clubbing spaces that you, you pay a premium to rent out the most elite spaces in the club to distinguish yourself even more from the crowd in the, in the club. And this is something that's uh, a very important part of the club culture in Shanghai today. And I would say it's a global phenomenon as well. So again, going back to the architect Yang Silio, according to statistics on Saturday night, the number of guests is five times that during the weekday. Thus, when a dance hall occupies a small space, it can be occupied by guests to full capacity on a normal night, but on Saturday night it is crowded beyond belief and may even be shut down. A large-scale dance hall might work well on Saturdays, but not on weekdays. The solution to this problem is to divide the dance hall into several smaller sections. We have added an upper floor and designed two banquet rooms that can fit several dozen people connected to the large dance hall but separated by curtains. So if the seats and tables surrounding the main dance floor are full, people can sit upstairs. And if the upstairs seats are full, people can make use of the banquet rooms. The main hall can seat 400 people, the upstairs hall 250 people, the banquet room 70 people. I think that the architect here was being a little bit too ideal about the space because um, in fact, the, the, the Baofang, the private rooms would have been rented for a premium. It's not that anybody could go there and sit down and enjoy them. Um, those were, were VIP rooms that you, you would have to rent out. The recording ran out uh, at my live talk, so I'm substituting it with a uh, recorded talk. So here we are at the uh, looking down on the main dance floor from the upper balcony and we're looking across at the circular dance floor and we can see the uh, tables lined up at the edge of the main dance floor and you can uh, imagine what the spectacle must have been like as you as you looked down and you saw um, the the men and the women dancing there and all lit up in multicolored lights by the colored wheels it was quite an extravaganza and then we wonder what was going on in that, uh, that upper dance floor. So here it is. And the important thing about the upper dance floor is that it was built on glass plates. And underneath the glass plates were colored lights. One woman, Ruth Day, the American tourist who visited Shanghai in 1935, wrote that dancing on the upper dance floor was like dancing on eggs. She thought it was a very unique experience. And uh, from what I heard, a Chinese lady who was dancing there in the 1930s uh, claimed that there was electric, uh, electricity pulsing underneath the dance floor because of the electric lights. And uh, once in a while, the electricity would run up people's legs and shock them. And she said it was the shock of modernity. But uh, I don't know, I just have that from hearsay. Um, so it must have been a very special place, and um, one person who I showed this image to said, oh, I can imagine um, that, you know, the, uh, 
the, the lights under, shining from underneath made the women's dresses translucent, and that must have been pretty sexy. And then the men's faces must have looked very demonic with the light coming up from underneath. So I think you can imagine all sorts of uh, things uh, with this dance floor, and it was certainly uh, way ahead of its time. I mean, you don't see uh, dance floors like this until the, the 70s, I think, in the di disco age. So I think Shanghai was, was way ahead of the world in uh, nightlife technology at that time. And then you see the entrance uh, from the upper dance floor leading to the, the private banquet room. And that was the banquet room or the baofang that could be rented out for the night for a private party. And, and as you can see here, it, uh, it was a very special space, an oval shape with a long table in the center and it was separated from the, the main hall by curtains. And then you have Art Deco motifs running around the ceiling, um, similar to what you see in, in other dance halls, ballrooms in Shanghai, elite ballrooms of that same age. Very stylized, very artistic. And the people who would rent this space included some of the most famous um, gangsters of that time, such as Big Ears Du, Du Yuesheng, who was the big gang boss of the Green Gang in the 1920s and 30s. He would rent this space out for parties. And uh, the Shanghai mayor would come and, and other dignitaries and officials because, of course, the uh, Guomindang had a close connection to the Green Gang, but that's another story. And then you would see um, starlets and actresses uh, hanging out in this private room as well. All the famous people, the, uh, the cream of Shanghai society might might be uh, hanging out in this in this room, and there was another private banquet room that they could also hang in, hang out in as well, and have their own private or semi-private parties. And that's how the uh, ballroom remained until throughout the 1930s and into the 40s. It's um, it continued to function as an elite dance hall, although it was a taxi dance hall after 1937 and you start to see uh, things like uh, instead of having a Russian orchestra they might have a Filipino orchestra uh, which were uh, let's just say they were more economical although they could jazz just as well as the the other orchestras in town um, and that's when the ballroom started hiring hostesses or in Chinese Wu Nu to uh, serve as dancing partners for male guests and they charged uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe 30 cents per dance. You could buy a book of tickets at the at the door and use a ticket to purchase a dance with a hostess. And the Paramount remained a taxi dance hall until it was shut down in 1954. And then it became a movie theater and it went on, uh, underwent many, many transformations over the decades. And uh, finally in the 2000s it reemerged as a dance hall. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening.